Hello Board Game Brothers and Sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, but most weeks are not like this week. I usually have about 15 to 25 games to cover, whereas this week we have just three. So things really slow down in the month of December. It's probably going to be like this for the rest of the month, likely with no games at all launching at the end of the month. But if you do want to see more upcoming games, definitely subscribe because we do this every week and there will be a ton of games launching in 2023. But for now, let's just go ahead and check out those games for this week. So let's check them out. And the first campaign we have launches on December 5th, and this one's called Pole Position. And this plays 1-6 to six players and takes about 45 to 180 minutes to play. And this is a competitive racing game where each player is going to be driving their own Formula 1 race car around the board trying to complete a number of laps first. Each player is going to be choosing their driver and team, and each of these are going to come with a special card and their own special abilities. And you'll be able to use those throughout the entirety of the game. Starting positions are determined by dice rolling, but each player is also going to have a number of stats that they're going to be starting out with as well. And if the dice grant you a better starting position, that's going to come at the cost of some of your skill points in order to balance out that advantage. Each player is also going to choose the type of tires that they want to put on their car, and this is all done in secret. And each of the tires are going to come with a different lifespan, as well as allowing you to roll a different colored die. And the reason that's important is because you're going to be rolling these dice to determine how far you get to move. So having a higher range of numbers on your die means that you'll be able to drive just a little bit faster. But there are some other advantages and disadvantages with each of these as well, like with the wet tires allowing you to drive better in the rainy weather. And the weather in this game is determined by a weather board so you always know what type of weather is coming up but you're going to be rolling a die to determine if that weather board is going to be progressing to the next space. So even though you know which conditions will be coming up you never really know how quickly they're going to come. And in each round, each player is going to be taking turns performing their movements, and this always happens with the player in the front going first, and then moving back to the player who is currently in last place. And like I said, you're going to be rolling your die to determine how many movement points you get, but then you'll also be able to spend engine, skill, or break points in order to move additional spaces. But each of these points work a little bit differently, with the engine points being only usable on straightaways, and the skill points being only usable on turns, so it does depend where you are on the track, and the amount of those points that you still have available. Players can also change lanes as part of their movement but this is most effectively done on turns because on a straightaway that's going to cost you a whole movement point just to move your car one lane to the side whereas on a turn you can actually move diagonally which allows you to move forward and change lanes at the same time. But you can even be more efficient on the turns by following the ideal racing line which is done by entering the turn on these double arrows and then that's going to allow you to move through the turn by following these checkered spaces. Of course, this assumes that there's nobody in your way. And if there are players in your way, you're going to have to go around them, which might move you out of that ideal racing line. But as you pass them, they also get to decide whether to just let you pass or to try and fight for position. And when they decide to fight for position, you're going to be rolling dice to determine which player wins that position. But if you are early in your movement, those additional movement points that you haven't used yet are going to count towards your side of that roll. So it gets more difficult to pass another player later in your movement action. Players can also choose to bid their skill points in secret to try and raise the value of their die, but once both players have decided that they no longer want to bid any skill points, then that's revealed and the player with the highest value wins. But if their total value ends up being the same value, then a collision is going to happen and each player is going to have to roll the collision die, and depending on the outcome of that die, it can have a various amount of effects. And the game continues like this until one player reaches the finish line, and then that player wins the game. And launching on December 6th, we have Soul The Last Days of a Star. And this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 45-90 to 90 minutes. And this is a competitive game where each player is going to have their own mothership rotating around a dying sun. And the goal of this game is to send in your smaller ships from your mothership in order to harvest energy from the sun and eventually gain enough that will allow you to launch your mothership into a whole new solar system. Of course, the more that you harvest the more unstable the sun becomes and there's only going to be enough time for a single player ship to escape the dying star. And something that I really like about this game is the way that the actions work. There's three different types of actions, move, convert, and activate, and each of them work a little bit differently and you're only allowed to do each of them in certain situations. The move action allows you to launch any sun divers that you currently have on your ship 
to a point on the board, and the move action also allows you to fly them around to the different areas of the board that they're able to access. And there is also the option to hurl them into the center of the sun if they're able to get there, and this will come at the cost of the unit, but it will grant you some nice benefits. And if you don't have too much time left, that doesn't sound like a terrible strategy. But my favorite category of actions in this game is the convert actions, and the reason that I like those so much is because you're actually going to be able to build all sorts of different stations out on the main board, but all of these stations are converted from your sun divers. So in order to build each of these stations, each one's going to require you to have sun divers in a particular formation, and whenever you do that you take your sun divers back and then you put the unit out on the board that you just built. And these different stations can be gates that allow you to send your sun divers deeper towards the core of the sun, or they could be buildings that allow you to harvest energy, transmit that energy to your mother ship, or even to build more sun divers. And one thing to note is that when you build a building you'll be able to draw some cards and you're going to be drawing more cards the closer your building is to the core of the sun. And you'll be able to spend these cards with different icons in order to activate some of the special ability cards that were drawn at the start of the game. And there are quite a few of these cards which will make each game play a little bit differently. But within those cards that you're spending in order to activate those abilities there is also so the solar flare card and anytime that gets drawn you're going to be moving the instability tracker one space forward and once that gets to the end the sun explodes and that triggers the end of the game so hopefully you're the one that was able to get enough energy in order to escape the solar system but in order to do that you're going to be using your sun divers to activate this different stations that you and the other players have built around on the board and yes you can use your opponent's stations but anytime you do that they're going to get a bonus action which will allow them to use it as well and this is going to be important because at the end of your turn you're going to be moving your mothership one space forward orbiting the sun which is going to change which portions of the sun that you have easiest access to. And the game continues until the instability track reaches the end and the player who harvested the most energy wins the game. And the next campaign we have launches on December 6th and this one's called Arabella and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 45-90 to 90 minutes to play. And this is a competitive 18xx train game but it is also a roll and write. So there are some similarities to this series of games where you're going to be trying to buy shares and earn dividends in the different trains but then you're also going to be building different tracks and running those trains yourselves which will affect the value of their shares and the dividends that get paid out. And the way this game works is that a pool of six dice will be rolled, and then players are going to be taking turns drafting from that pool. You can take multiple dice, but they have to be of the same value, and players will be able to spend these dice in order to perform different actions, and both the value and the number of dice that you have will affect or modify the action that you intend to take. And the different actions that players have available to them are to buy and build tracks, buy train engines and carriages in order to create their trains, and then run those trains in order to earn an income as well as pay dividend to any shareholders of the train that you intend to run. And one thing to note here is that the larger trains can carry more passengers and goods so they will earn you more money. Players can also choose to purchase shares or they can spend an action just to earn money if there's no other actions that you want to take. And players will be earning victory points for each of the shares that they hold, as well as any objectives that they're able to fulfill. And then finally, you'll be earning victory points by any icons or extra dice that you unlocked on your player board. The player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game, and if you are interested in this one, you'll definitely want to follow along because it'll get you a really nice 10 euro discount on your pledge. And those are all the campaigns I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we still have an awesome giveaway to announce, and this one is for Duke in Danger. And this is a competitive card game where players are going to be alternating between the role of a ranger, a poacher, or a tourist. The poacher is always going to be putting a duke in danger, and then players are going to be using a trick-taking mechanism in order to try and save that duke. But if you're a tourist, you can actually choose whether you want to save the dukes or put more in danger. And if you want to put more in danger, all you have to do is play another card of the same value of a card that has already been played, but putting it into its own stack. And that will put another duke in danger, which creates another area for the trick-taking to happen in tandem. And any dukes that weren't successfully saved at the end of the turn will count as a strike against the ranger player, and then the rolls switch and the game continues. Players are drawing new cards into their hand every turn, and once the deck has been depleted three times, the player with the least lost dukes wins the game. And this giveaway is going to be for the Ranger Pledge, and this is a deluxified version of the game. We're going to be getting the core game as well as a ton of expansions and upgraded components. 
And this is the only giveaway we're going to have this week, and it is offered worldwide, so there's no need for a hashtag, but all you have to do is leave a comment down below, and you can go ahead and say whatever you want down there, but one thing about this campaign is that it was inspired by the efforts to try and help the dukes, which are an endangered species of monkey, so if you're not sure what to say, there's actually a lot of endangered animals out there, and maybe you could leave a comment letting us know of one, maybe the one that you are most fond of. Now let's go ahead and draw a winner for last week's giveaway, which was for a pledge for Dark Venture, and a draw I use this application here. All these extra names are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you like this content and you'd like to support the channel and make all these efforts a little bit more sustainable, I do have a Patreon in the description below if you'd like to check it out, and I appreciate you taking a look. But let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw a winner. And the winner is. Miles Tavin, and this is one of our Patreon subscribers, so I'll reach out to you, Miles, and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for Dark Venture, or you can always email me at adam at shelfclutter.com. And that's everything I have for you this week, a way shorter week than usual. I don't know what I'm going to do with all my extra time tonight, probably something unhealthy. But as always, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, keep that shelf cluttered and the table full. What? <laughs>